OK, um, can I just check? Can everybody hear me? OK, um, so my name uh, is Anup Desi. I'm a GP and chair of um, North and Waveney Clinical Commissioning Group, but I'd like to welcome you to the annual general meeting of uh, the Clinical Commissioning Group, uh, which we hold in public. Uh, and in the, in the current situation, we're doing it um, live through Teams. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, if I can have the next slide, please. So just some uh, some housekeeping to start with. So for people um, tuning in through Teams, um, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions uh, at, at our AGM. Uh, you can post your questions um, on uh, on your screen on the right hand side and we'll try and answer as many of the questions as we can at the end of the meeting during um, the question and answer session and the panel members will be able to answer those questions then. Um, for those who um, would like to turn subtitles on, they can do uh, at any point. There should be uh, an icon on your screen which allows you to, to turn those on. Um, this meeting uh, is being recorded uh, and uh, it will be available later after the event on, on YouTube. And we'll also be um, live tweeting throughout the AGM, so please use the hashtag, uh, which is hashtag NWCCG AGM to get involved with, discussion, with discussions and conversations as we go. Okay, so can I have the next slide, please? So hopefully um, you've got the agenda and the, and the first uh, bit is for me just to introduce myself. I, uh, as I say, uh, I'm, I'm clinical chair of the CCG uh, and I thought I'd just spend a couple of minutes giving you some context into, in, in terms of how the CCG started. Uh, and you'll be aware that uh, it came out of the creation from the previous five CCGs within Norfolk and Waveney, which were merged into one uh, on April the 1st, uh, 2020. Um, I mean, if you look back at that time, it was a time of considerable uncertainty uh, for people, for individuals and for the organisation. Uh, within the CCG, many, uh, many people were transitioning into new, new roles within, uh, within the new CCG and, and as part of, of new teams that had, been, that, that had been formed. But if you remember, it was a time when society was, was going through quite a bit of change, even at that time. Brexit had just happened a couple of months before. We, we knew there would be change coming and we didn't quite know what uncertainty that would bring. Uh, and then coronavirus struck and we'd all heard of, of the coronavirus uh, previously uh, within the SARS uh, epidemic that occurred uh, around 15 years ago. Uh, but there, there were cases that were coming up uh, just as we started. So the, uh, the, the lockdown started literally a few weeks before we started. So the first year of the CCG has really been born uh, at the time of great uncertainty and challenge. Um, and, um, and, and, and the pandemic actually has been quite a crisis for this, uh, for, for this uh, country and, and the NHS as well. And I use that term uh, advisedly, uh, you know, crisis uh, is uh, times of danger and uncertainty. And um, the, the Chinese for, for crisis are, to, are two brush strokes. Uh, and the one brush stroke is for danger and the other is for opportunity. That's the definition of uh, of crisis in, in Chinese and it very much reflects really the, the, the sort of crisis that we've felt and the way that we've met those challenges uh, and one of my observations uh, is that despite all the challenges actually uh, it has given us an opportunity uh, to meet some of those challenges with new opportunity and new ways of doing things. Um, you'll be aware that the NHS long-term plan came out early in 20. 19 and set out some of the challenges that the NHS faced and some of the opportunities and ways that we needed to meet those challenges. Uh, and the last year, the pandemic has really accelerated a lot of the changes that we needed, uh, particularly, as it says in the, in the slide, uh, in relation to how we use online and remote consultations, generally the use of digital and IT, uh, development of primary care and groups of practices working together as primary care networks, which are PCNs, and the way that our acute hospitals have collaborated together to meet the challenge, which, which is something we very much wanted them to do before the pandemic started. So my observation has been that 
uh, we, we've been at a time of huge challenge, but also one where uh, actually the system has worked a lot closer than I've seen it uh, work for many years. Um, so I, I'm going to now hand over to Melanie Craig, uh, Chief Executive, who's going to go through some of that, some of the things that have happened over the last year in our first year of, uh, of operation. So I'll hand over to Melanie. Thank you very much indeed, Anu, um, for that really um, helpful and helpful uh, introduction, which really set the scene and took me right back to um, the beginning of 2020 when this um, annual general meeting is a reflection on, on that that year. And, and I wanted to just start by saying a little about um, the past 12 months. And, and certainly, of course, um, the, the, the first month of that year in uh, April 2020, the new CCG, the newly formed CCG, had had formed just as the pandemic uh, broke. So on to the next slide, please. And we indeed had huge challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, as every, every organisation, every part of society, every family, every individual did. And my reflection is that the work that we've done the previous year to form one single organisation then made us uh, have a much stronger impact on managing the pandemic together as a single team. So it, that was certainly a very important thing that we've done. And this photo on the slide here, um, I, I, I love this photo of Dr. Um, Dr. Pinch and Dr. Gare from uh, North Norfolk. And I know that this was taken on a Sunday when they were in full PPE. It was hot. It was, I think it was in the middle of August in that year when there was just a sense of commitment and urgency to vaccinate residents in care homes. And I know that that was what um, James and Ed were going to do at that time, as were many, many GPs just dedicated to trying to vaccinate the most vulnerable in our society as quickly as possible. And we'll talk more about the vaccination later, but it's it's wonderful to reflect on since that time, one and a half million vaccines have been delivered across Norfolk and Waveney, and the vast majority of those have been from delivered by general practice um, with huge support from our community across, but really want to pay tribute to the practices and the um, many volunteers and organisations who worked with us um, to manage the pandemic and then to the and then on to the vaccination programme. And, and of course, it was also a time of terrible tragedy for families, for individuals, losing, losing loved ones, losing colleagues. Um, and of course, our thoughts are with those who have been impacted by the pandemic. And it's important as we're going through still in the pandemic and also recovering from that last year that we continue to uh, listen to and address the needs of patients and members of the public and seek their views. So on to the next slide, please. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about the vaccination programme, which started back in December. So we're coming towards the final quarter of 2021. Um, and sitting here today, it's just again a wonderful reflection um, that we have in North Waveney vaccinated 93% of all of our over 18s have had their first and 87% have had their second dose, which is just an incredible achievement. <clears throat> and Norfolk and Waveney has consistently been the strongest performing of all of the six systems in the east of England. <clears throat> but perform very strongly nationally as well. And we're now, of course, on the looking at trying to address the booster program and the 12 to 15 seeing really good ups, uptake on that. But rem, I was thinking back again to that period in the year where the vaccination program, there was again so much um, anticipation, so much hope, and it was a hugely complex piece of work that, enabled, that meant hospital consultants and local GPs um, had to come together to work as closely as possible. We just saw great determination and um, giving of their own personal time from 
all of the volunteers that we've had and the support staff involved. And indeed, again, many, many practice staff and community staff who worked weekends and long hours and are still doing that today to deliver the vaccination programme. So I want to just thank all of them, all of you. On to the next one, please. On to the next, yeah, thank you. And, and so it was really important over this last year that the health and care system came together to work as a single team where we could get the biggest, have the biggest impact. And certainly during the pandemic, this, the C clinical commissioning group, that newly formed group of the five CCGs, we have around 440 staff and all of them were redeployed into different roles at the start of the pandemic against a number of priorities that we reset. We were in a level four incident and our overall goal was to support frontline clinical services. So if your role wasn't doing anything that was supporting frontline clinical services, it needed to change so that we did that. And that was uh, essential. And as part of that, a quarter of our staff were redeployed, their registered nurses redeployed to actually work in frontline positions. And here we have a very moving photo of Kate Barlow, one of our nurses. She's a critical, experienced critical care nurse. And Kate rejoined the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital during the first wave and indeed went back uh, after January to support the critical care nurses and doctors in the Norfolk and Norwich. And there were many examples like that, um, but working together and with the voluntary sector as well, we were able to achieve uh, uh, achieve much, much more. And on to the next slide, please. Clearly the um, latter half of the year, as we started to see winter pressures emerge and more um, more demand from more uh, common conditions that maybe people had been uh, waiting on, had not been willing to come forward and had been um, concerned about coming forward into the health system. We've started to see that demand in increase and, and that's important that we do see that for people who need the care and treatment for their physical health, physical health. of course, a huge amount of, of mental health um, concerns and deterioration for people and this is putting enormous pressure on the health service at the moment as we're both trying to continue to cope with the pandemic and many of the restrictions to continue to address the vaccination programme but also to really recover not just in terms of when people have been referred into one of the hospitals waiting for, for treatment but indeed into primary care and general practice as um, people have uh, their conditions have deteriorated and GPs are looking to get back into and are in fact doing more routine monitoring of longer term conditions. So it's really important that people are coming forward um, and this is now a really uh, key time for the NHS where it feels more busy um, than even the, that first those first few months of the COVID pandemic. And we are seeing an increase um, in patients coming forward. And we're now starting to see, of course, an, a slight increase in patients again coming forward with COVID-19. So I think that's my final slide. Oh, one more, one more very important slide I did want to mention, which is around staff health and wellbeing and equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, it's been a really gruelling and exhausting time for all health and care staff and of course and that's just in their in their work life and in their home life as well. So it has been incredibly important that the CCG that we the organisation focuses and prioritises the well-being of all of our staff um, and that we and we have carried out a number of uh, activities and um, and a number of support mechanisms in place for staff. But equally, I think the pandemic has really highlighted disparages in social inequalities, social injustice and health inequalities, and particularly in communities from different ethnic backgrounds. 
And for the organisation, for our organisation, um, we have been delighted to, proud to, to um, sign up to the East of England anti-racism strategy to attend the launch and develop our own equality and diversity and inclusion programme for both staff uh, and, and the CCG as an employer, but also in how we carry out our business and how we can ensure that all that we do is commissioning services which address the inequalities in access to healthcare that many people are experiencing. And this has been a very, very important and significant theme over the last year, which I expect to uh, increase further over coming years. So thank you, Anouk. OK, thank you. Thank you very much um, for that, uh, Melanie. Um, we're now going to um, ask uh, Dr Claire Hambling to give us um, uh, a presentation uh, on uh, what's been a groundbreaking um, initiative called um, Protect Now. So I, I'll ask, I'll hand over to Claire. Thank you, Anoop. We've already heard um, today about the opportunity that can arise from a crisis and also some of the remarkable achievements of collaboration across health and social care and voluntary sector organisations throughout the course of the pandemic. And these projects are a really good example of what can be achieved. And I would actually um, like to suggest that it's possible this might not have happened had it not been for the pandemic. So despite the fact that we have witnessed so much tragedy um, across the world over the last 18 months, there are a few things that have happened that are really transformative and I think are set to lead the way we may provide health and social care and think about those social determinants of health and holistic care in the coming years. And it's been a real privilege to be part of this team. Next slide, please. It started almost as soon as we saw the arrival of COVID on the shores of the United Kingdom. Many of us had watched with horror some of the um, stories that had unfolded, particularly in southern Europe, and were terrified of the risk it may have um, should it do the same on arrival in the UK. So a number of clinicians from across the whole of Norfolk and Waveney got together, um, galvanised by um, a, a few key personnel, and we created within a matter of four weeks a, a, a really um, innovative system of care which combines um, um, the use of data, electronic online platforms and people, very importantly people, in order to optimise the care of people who we considered to be at risk should they be exposed to COVID-19. And during the course of the project, we invited more than 40,000 people from across Norfolk to participate in the project, of whom um, just under 25,000 people did participate. We created an online platform where they could report, um, self-report um, any health related issues, but also flag any concerns that they, that they might have and ask for help. And very importantly, um, that help was able to be delivered not just by local general practitioners and other healthcare providers, but by virtual clinical teams who had volunteered to help provide that necessary support and care by our partners across um, Norfolk County Council and Suffolk County Council, and also many, many partners in the voluntary sector. We responded to over 12,500 calls for help, um, which is really quite a remarkable achievement. And what was really quite impressive was that fewer than 800 of those were calls for help that required the input from a general practitioner, which just illustrated how important it was to connect all these various partners in providing holistic care for our local population. What we have demonstrated is that in association with the project, the people who engaged um, suffered significantly fewer COVID-19 infections, fewer hospital ad admissions and lower mortality. Next slide, please. Um, 
As a consequence of the project, which we're all very proud of, um, we have been recognised nationally and shortlisted for a number of prestigious awards. Um, last week we pitched to the uh, British Medical Journal um, and this afternoon actually we have a team who are at telling our story to the Health and Health Service Journal for their awards. I'd also like to highlight the contribution by two of our local GPs, Dr Janine Smurl and Dr Julian Brown, who were um, two of the key um, personnel involved right at the beginning of the project, and they have both been honoured nationally, being shortlisted for the GP of the Year Award um, by the General Practice Awards. So um, I think it just shows there's a lot of interest in this project um, and um, the team are very proud of what we have achieved. The other thing just to mention is we were supported by over 100 volunteers, all of whom um, gave off their time, um, many of whom were already employed in NHS roles during the course of the pandemic. So it really was quite a remarkable feat that we would be able to deliver this project. Next slide, please. Following on from the methodology that we've developed, um, we've now been able to use the same approach to deliver care across a number of um, other um, health related concerns. So we have um, uh, a, 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 a several other different projects which we now are um, instigating. If I could actually move on to the next slide, please. Um, which again works in the same way, so working across general practice, but li linking with specialists in secondary care, linking with colleagues in social care and linking with voluntary sector organisations. So this is just an illustration of a few of those projects that we are now able to deliver. So we've been supporting people who are at risk of developing type 2 diabetes, um, encouraging referral into the NHS Diabetes Prevention Programme, which is known as Healthier You. We've also been working with our colleagues in mental health services to support the uptake of um, interventions to support people living with anxiety and low mood. And that's obviously been particularly important on the back of the pandemic. We're very aware that access to medical services has been difficult during the pandemic. So we've also been um, supporting um, some of the recovery of those services and encouraging um, return to normal service delivery, particularly around um, such as cervical cancer screening and also supporting some of our more vulnerable people such as those with learning disability and serious mental illness to ensure that they are able to um, receive the care that they need. So a very exciting project that has generated a lot of new ideas and new ways of um, accessing healthcare for many of our population um, and as I say um, a real privilege to have been part of of this team. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, for that, Claire. And um, I mean, can I just say, I think this has really been one of the success stories for, for Norfolk and Waveney. Uh, and, it, and in particular, I think the way that it reached out to groups of very vulnerable and frightened people at this, particularly at the start of the pandemic, um, people who are isolating in their own homes. Uh, and I know from um, from contacts that I've had with patients who received the service, they really appreciated that actually people called them and reassured them and were there to, to support them when they were feeling quite isolated and, and frightened in their homes. And I think it's great that we're now using that methodology to uh, to identify patients who normally in, in, in previous situations have missed out on a lot of the care and access to care, which uh, we, which is available to people who are uh, who, who use things in the in the normal way. So I think it's a fantastic project and I, and I think it's going to be one of the success stories for, for, for healthcare provision in the future. So thank you very much for, for the whole team uh, for that. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll probably uh, have some further conversations about the uh, about that project in the questions and answers session. Um, but I think we'll move on now to the to the next item uh, on the agenda, which is um, on uh, on patient and public involvement. And I'm going to ask um, Paul Hemingway, our Associate Director for Communication and Engagement, uh, to, to start the presentation on, on engagement. Over to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Anoop. Um, next slide, please. 
so hi everybody. Um, I am still relatively new uh, to Norfolk and Waverley. Um, I've been with the organi organisation, the system now since January this year, but so much has happened um, within that period of time and from a communications and engagement perspective, as you would expect, we have been very much involved in the very fast, quick and uh, moving um, feast of COVID-19. Um, and that's where a lot of our um, operational responsibilities have continued to lie. So despite COVID-19 having um, some very different impacts on engagement and making it much harder, it's also given us quite a lot of exciting new possibilities. So as an example, um, obviously, as everybody will know, quite a lot of traditional core engagement activities had to be put on hold, and particularly in light of COVID-19. But some of the things that we have done um, and tried some really new, innovative and exciting ways of reaching out um, to patients and members of the public have been the introduction of virtual events and Facebook Live conversations that we've had over the past uh, 12 to, to 18 months. And just an example, uh, we held two Facebook Live events uh, with About With Friends um, and their a learning disability organisation that are based in North Norfolk. And it was attended by representatives from the CCG, Norfolk Community Health and Care Trust and Norfolk County Council. And what we did was basically reach out to individuals that had um, have learning disability and or autism and ask them some very specific questions about COVID-19 to gain insight and intelligence on their experiences so far. And in August 2020, we asked that we asked that particular group about their experiences of adults with learning disability and autism and their carers during lockdown. And then we did a follow up um, engagement activity in May 2021, where we asked adults with LD and autism and their carers about getting their COVID-19 vaccination. So whilst it's been fairly limited in terms of face to face engagement, we have wherever possible um, in and amongst been able to reach out to people in very very different and innovative ways. So next slide, please. So some of the what, what we did find from these events, and it's been really insightful um, and, and telling in terms of helping us um, to engage with particular groups when it came to the vac COVID vaccination programme and also reaching out to carers and reaching out, out to individuals with a learning disability and or autism, specifically looking at their experiences of COVID. And what, what we did find is that particularly when it, when it came to um, liaising with individuals um, about the COVID vaccine is that it didn't wait long um, and that they thought vaccine staff were great and supported and, and very um, attentive to individuals and their needs. And some of this really insightful intelligence helped to create some of these specific LD COVID vaccination clinics that we've held and we continue to hold um, across Norfolk and Waverley. And those were pioneered initially by the James Paget University Hospital. So what we found is that actually by reaching out and engaging with different communities and different groups, we've been able to use that feedback, feedback and insight to actually help improve um, our vaccination programme uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. What we've also been focusing on specifically is, as you would expect, it's really important, as Melanie mentioned earlier in the in the presentation today, is that we try as much as we try as hard as we can to really communicate the, about the benefits of having the COVID-19 vaccine and specifically going to particular groups. So one of the key core campaigns that's really been influenced by people's feedback and reaching out into communities via surveys who were in get via online engagement forums is actually helping us to do to to pull together and, and roll out vaccine hesitancy hesitancy campaigns so the i had mine campaign is a classic example on this slide which was aimed at people over 30 and also care workers and what we did was actually gain insight and intelligence from these particular groups and actually use their photos and their and their stories to actually encourage other people to have the vaccine and we found that this approach has worked really well. Next slide please. We've also very recently, um, and this campaign is still going on, um, is roll out the Every Vaccine Counts campaign, which is very different to the traditional campaign um, across the um, 
across the country, um, but it does um, support um, the regional campaign um, for vaccination. And what we've done basically as a result of hearing from more than 1,300 people, particularly young people under the age of 30 across Norfolk and Waverley, is use their feedback, their insight, um, what would be important them, to them to get a vaccine, what are some of the barriers to getting a vaccine. And we've used all that thinking, all that insight to actively pull together the Every Vaccine Counts campaign. So rather than us, for example, as a system thinking about what people may want, we've actually really made public and patient involvement and feedback critical to the vaccination campaign um, that we've rolled out across Norfolk and Waverley. Next slide please. And one of the things that we're focusing on at the moment and still continuing to engage with patients and members of the public is focusing on vaccination for under 18s, pregnancy and fertility. So what we've developed very recently, which was published a couple of weeks ago, was using the feedback and the insight and intelligence that we've got since we since we started um, early in the pandemic and actually using that insight to help inform dedicated Q&A resources. Um, we've got had lots of people under the age of 18 completing a, a local survey that we've had ongoing over the last couple of months. We've responded to uh, people's concerns and queries by um, having real people from North and Waverney um, articulating messages. And on this slide, you've got um, a, a lady, a Claire from Norwich, um, who um, had both of her vaccines and actually sharing those messages far and wide um, across different um, communities and different platforms to encourage people to get the vaccine. And just recently uh, we had um, a vaccine Q&A which uh, was attended by quite a few people um, and had a team and panel of experts. And what we're now in the process of doing is responding to some of the additional comments and questions that are coming in and actually getting these videos translated into different languages. And they're about to go onto our website very soon. So that's just some of the ways that we've been proactively engaging, responding to people's questions, queries or thoughts or concerns and providing reassuring messages to try and encourage people um, um, to get the vaccine and equally um, make sure that they feel confident to encourage other people to get the vaccine as well. So that's a very brief overview from some of the key core work that we've been leading on as a core comms and engagement team. Um, and I'd now like to hand over to um, Sajata from One Norwich Practices, who will take you through a different element of patient public engagement. Uh, hello, um, my name is, uh, thank you Paul, um, my name is Sujata B.S. Walkley. Um, next slide please. I'm a patient representative for One Norwich, a brand new role actually that started back, I started back in December 2020 and like the rest of us, you know, everything was very Covid at that time so I was straight into the Covid vaccine clinics, kind of seeing for real what it was like and having a chance to talk to patients. So that gave me a really ins a real good insight as to you know, patient opinions, views on how patients could get involved giving their feedback. And at that same time, um, you know, I was a link between the GP practices and the um, One Norwich, the primary care network. So that was really important. My focus really is, following on from Paul, is to be that kind of link person between GPs and the patients and making them aware of what's going on within the Norwich area. So. One of the people I work with yeah, um, is a primary care community officer from the Norfolk um, Systems and Advice Bureau. So one thing I've been doing is just passing on various events and so on that's taking place that patients wouldn't otherwise be aware of. Next slide, please. OK, so what's been happening? I've been, as I say, I've been working with all the 21 Norwich GP practices who are at different stages with their patient groups. Some are very active and I'm really happy to say within the last month or so two or at least three of them have met face to face which is absolutely superb but during Covid some have carried on meeting virtually while others have found it very difficult so one of my jobs is now getting those things up and running and getting more patients to kind of join one of my jobs is to encourage a diverse group of people to these patient groups I'm working very closely with 
range of patients with health watch with gp practice managers to see that happen um, one of the events that's been going on is a pop-up shop in mile cross which is a very community-based event and that's the kind of thing that what i tend to do is encourage communities to get involved and help each other by sharing those experiences and using the resources next slide please so one of the things we're looking at is promoting patient involvement in every aspect that we can. And we're very lucky at One Norwich to have a new comms person, uh, Ian Wakefield, who's joined as an engagement um, and communications person. So we're trying to encourage more through social media and working with GP practice managers and patients really to see how we can further that really through um, Twitter, Facebook particularly, etc. I think the other um, involvement that we've had is that Norwich Practices, the Vulnerable Adult Service, are in keen to work with us and provide us some feedback on their patients' um, experiences. So that's something I'm really looking forward to and I'm sure, you know, will help us an awful lot. Next slide, please. So what I did as part of my role was um, a few months ago produced a local newsletter for all the patient groups. We were very lucky in that Two patient leads gave us some case studies. Um, a practice main manager gave us an insight as to what it was like during COVID times and the involvements that the parent patients had. We're hoping to make this more of an active newsletter. So maybe every six months or so, get views of patients and get really patients on board as to what we could do differently. OK, next slide, please. So moving forward, what I'm hoping to do is build on the work that I've done so far by seeing these patients and giving you know every patient the chance to have that voice and to take that feedback further either through patient groups or patient events or anything so that's something I'm looking at at the moment patient drop-ins and so on. One of the things we've, I've done so far is also to link patients to the research engagement team so clinical nurses are now going into a couple of PPG groups where they can make patients aware of the research and chance to get involved in medical research. And then obviously working alongside Paul and the CCG to share learning and working on patient engagement right across the primary care network, really. So if you have any questions, my email address is there and please drop me a line. Thank you. Great. Um, th thank, thank you very much, Paul and Sujata, for the, um, that very informative presentation on uh, on key areas of patient and um, uh, and public involvement uh, within the CCG in the last year. Um, the next uh, item is looking at one of the key functions of the CCG, which is commissioning uh, or pro you know providing organising healthcare for our community. So um, I'm going to uh, hand over initially to Kath Byford, our chief nurse, to highlight some of the key areas uh, that, that we highlighted. Obviously, there are a lot more details within the annual report, but uh, we're going to highlight some of the key areas that have been our focus in the last year. So I'll hand over to Kath Byford. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? So hello, um, my name is Kath Byford um, and as Anupa said, I'm the Chief Nurse for the Norfolk and Waverley CCG. I would also like to introduce Dr Arden Ross, who is a local GP, um, a governing body member and is also our mental health clinical advisor. So um, over to you, Arden. Thank you very much, Kath, and thank you, Anup. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Next slide, please. It would be fair to say that before the pandemic, we were experiencing a huge rise in presentations in mental health, mental ill health and mental distress all across the board. And I think the pandemic has really exacerbated that. What we noted was increasing presentations of mental health distress in all areas, um, both from people coming forward for the first time, but also in that those who already had mental distress um, with significant exacerbations of that. And that led to increased referrals um, from all system to all system partners. Unfortunately, this resulted in long waits with increasing numbers of people heading towards emergency departments to have their needs met and increased out of area placements. And we also noticed increased presentations, um, particularly from young people 
for children and young people under the age of 18. And this led to pressures on beds, both regionally and nationally. So the pandemic really exacerbated a situation that, that was already difficult in mental health. Next slide, please. However, we had already underway a significant mental health transformation programme. And as a consequence of the pandemic, I think it would be fair to say that, it, that we used this as an opportunity to really accelerate that mental health programme. And it also it enabled us to work collaboratively with all our system partners to do that. And there was a real will to engage and to get things done. And this was supported by the CCG financially as well. One of the first things we did was to uh, establish a first response line, which we did within the first month or so of the pandemic started, starting so that people experiencing distress could call a number to uh, receive help. And we also set up a line for professionals at the same time. We also established our mental health board, strengthening it and bringing in many more new partners um, to represent their organisations which currently is now co-chaired by Norfolk County Council. So sitting at the board, we have um, representation from, from social care, uh, experts by experience as well, and, um, and a public health and all, and, and very wide representation and collaboration, which has been fantastic, enabled us to work so much more effectively together. Our ambition is very much to offer mental health at the point in towards people in their own communities. So improving that access and early intervention offer so that people receive their care closer to home, supported in their communities. We already had plans underway to introduce mental health practitioners into all of our PCNs, and that happened very early on. Um, so we were quite ahead compared to other systems and we'll be planning to build on that over the course of the year with uh, increased numbers of people joining the teams to support that. We've also developed our crisis alternatives. We uh, have already had a crisis house in place and there are plans to open two more over the next year. Um, in, and in addition to that, um, improving our crisis response, increasing our access to trauma therapies as well and opening up our hubs. Our under 18s are following the I Thrive model, um, which is a much more community based support model linking in with um, with education and social care. And we also introduced very early on um, COOTH, which is an online counselling service available for children and young people, um, providing anonymous, safe, moderated support. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the, we we expanded some of the pilot schemes that we already um, had um, underway in the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital, known as the Rush Scheme, which links people, young people who have self harmed, up with voluntary sector organisation to really support them in their own homes and and safely um, navigate their mental distress. Next slide, please. Our priorities over the coming year are to strengthen our support for our primary care teams, investing in, a in um, additional roles such as our mental health pharmacists, our recovery workers and much more around um, in increasing um, our investment in psychological therapies so that we're now able to um, offer a much wider range of therapies, particularly for people experiencing who've experienced trauma, but also uh, supporting people with long term conditions. Our prevention model is, is at the forefront of all that we do so that we're trying to provide help at a much earlier stage for people in their own communities. We were also delighted that we were accept, our bid was accepted for uh, community services um, to invest in our serious mental illness programme, which will enable us to support people with personality disorders, mental health rehabilitation needs and eating disorders um, at an earlier stage. And we've also introduced the FREED model, which is an, a much a, an earlier intervention model for new presentations of eating disorders so that people are supported and, and, and hopefully prevent them from going on to have a much more entrenched illness. We've provided support for those who've, ex who've experienced COVID, not only patients, but also um, our staff as well, introducing a series of, of hubs for staff to come forward um, to receive support. 
and um, we're building on the first point, uh, the first response service, which was the first point of contact for mental health over the coming year, linking it with all our crisis response services um, as a first point of contact. So linking it in with 111. So we have a, men a mental health and physical health integrated um, offer um, in order to uh, safely navigate and support people as soon as they present. Next slide, please. Our community wellbeing hubs are absolutely at the heart of all that we're doing and I'm absolutely delighted that we will by the end of next year we'll have five wellbeing hubs open all across Norfolk and Waveney um, which provide direct support to people um, for their all of their mental health needs and all of the things that influence their mental health such as financial support linking them in with um, domestic violence support for instance support for LGBTQ um, and in the case of the soon to be open Norwich Hub, providing support for forced migrants as well, um, which we're absolutely delighted about. And having just visited uh, one of the hubs when it first opened, I was absolutely overwhelmed that in the space of just a few weeks, the hub, people within the hub had already managed to link up with community groups and organisations and hearing so many stories of patients and people that have been supported and, and turned around um, away from the medical model um, was was really in, quite inspiring and I would encourage all of you to to visit your your local hubs as well and in addition to these hubs that the, the CCG has commissioned will also uh, mind are also um, will be providing a network of hubs themselves as, um, in addition to that next slide please so uh, from uh, from the point of view of our children and young people, um, as I said, the, the mainstay is, is following the Thrive model, which is helping people at a much earlier stage. And in order to do that, there's a number of initiatives such as supporting and building the workforce, introducing new roles and also developing some additional therapeutic offer um, for children and their families. Um, and this this programme is, is again another on, ongoing that we wish to develop and continue with. So at this point, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to the mental health team that I work with, who have been absolutely inspirational over the last couple of years in really in really bringing forward so many of these transformation projects um, that we wanted to do um, to a much earlier stage and working in collaboration with all of our system partners, including our wonderful VCSE colleagues. And thank you also to all my CCG colleagues for supporting this programme of work. I'll hand over now to Kath to talk about the uh, other quality initiatives that are undergoing. We are undergoing. Thank you, Arden. Um, next slide, please. So I'd like to start by saying quality is at the heart of everything that we do, and we are absolutely committed to improving the quality of services and the quality outcomes for our local people across North and Waveney. Next slide, please. So I'd like to focus um, on the Safeguard in Adult review that was published this month um, for Joanna, John and Ben, um, who were young adults that died in Giesel Corston Park. Um, for people who don't know, this is a private hospital that is now closed um, and it's a, it was a specialist at learning disability unit um, and patients were placed there by CCGs and NHS England from all across the country. But Ben, was 32 and he was a Norfolk resident. He had Down syndrome and was an inpatient at Giesel Corsa Park for more than two years before he died in July last year. Um, and Norfolk and Waveney CCG fully accepts the findings of the Safeguarding Adult Review and re recognises that we did not get this right and that our commissioning and oversight of Ben's care was not good enough both for him and his family. Next slide, please. The findings and recommendations of the Safeguarding Adult Review that was published will be used as the platform for change and will be specifically linked to how services are commissioned for people with learning disabilities and autistic people and how we oversee the services for people with learning disabilities and also autistic people. And a, a number of um, actions and changes have been set out in a report that is being taken to the governing body this afternoon with much more detail than we're hearing today. Um, and um, a link to that will be made available. 
As part of some of the changes that we're making, I will only highlight a few. Um, we are making um, changes to the way in which we commission alongside our colleagues in the local authorities, um, which will result in a much more um, enhanced joint approach to what we commission and how we commission services and care for people with learning disabilities and autistic people. And will include, but not limited to, a pool budget with the adult social care team in Norfolk County Council and a commitment across the whole system to a minimal reliance on independent hospital provision for people with learning disabilities and autistic people. And that will include only admitting people to any inpatient hospital setting in extreme circumstances and, and, um, and to limit out of area placements by clinical exception only. Next slide, please. We are de developing a programme of engagement, listening and hearing with patients, families and carers. Um, and there will be a focus on the lived experience of the individuals and their families um, to inform this. There will be also greater oversight of providers and there is now a rigorous application and oversight of quality monitoring, which has been enhanced through a number of measures that we've put in place, which includes the, re the recruitment of more learning disability specialist nurses within the CCG, but also a much greater focus on the physical health of our patients and not just focusing on their behaviours associated with their learning disability or those people with autism. But the legacy for Joanna, John and Ben and their families is that the Norfolk Way and Norfolk and Waveney system is committed to preventing another person or their family experiencing the physical or emotional harm as a result of services that they receive which are ineffective or inadequate. And we will achieve this by working um, much more closely with system partners, changing how we work in avoiding admissions to inpatient hospital settings, improving our oversight of patients and seeking innovation in our commissioning and, and our practice. So um, I would like to hand back to Anoop. Thank you for listening. Great, thank, um, thanks very much for that, um, Kath and Arden. Um, we'll now move on to um, the um, annual report and account and the, and the financial position. I'm, I'm going to hand over to John Ingham, our Chief uh, Finance Officer. John? So thank you, Anoop, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to spend a couple of moments talking to you about our annual report and accounts for 2021, which are available on our website under the publication section. So moving to the next slide, please. It's, it's a requirement for all NHS organisations to produce and publish an annual report each year. And NHS England sets clear guidelines as to what should be included and the timescale for submission and review. So there's three main sections to the annual report. The, the first one is a performance report, which basically describes our key activities over the last year. And this time has obviously had a very clear focus on the impact of the pandemic and also includes some of the work that you've already heard about today, such as the COVID protect work. The next section is an accountability report, which includes more information about who we are and how we are run. And then finally, there's the annual accounts. The accounts and sections of the annual report are also subject to independent review by our external auditors, Ernst Young, and their report is also published on our website alongside the annual report and accounts, so that you can see that they've given us a clean bill of health on what we published. As we now move on to the next slide, I'll just talk briefly about our financial position in the year to March 2021. And, and firstly, I thought it'd be worth just clarifying what a CCG actually does in case people aren't quite clear who are listening in. So simplistically, when, when the government agrees the money that's available to the NHS, that's then shared out by NHS England broadly on the basis of population and it's given to local CCGs. Our job then is to plan and to buy local health services for our population and buy those from hospitals, community services, GPs, voluntary sector, a whole range of organisations, and then to monitor the quality of those services. And last year, the funding that we received on behalf of our local population was just under £1.9 billion in Northcombe and Waveney. And that equates to about £1,700 per person. Or looking at it another way, we spend about £5 million a day on healthcare. So moving to the next slide, please. It, it's important to note, um, as has been the theme throughout the, the AGM today, that clearly this has been a, a year like no other. So normally we would have had our published allocation before the start of the year. We'd set our plans, agree contracts with our local provider organisations and be challenged to deliver savings to live within our funding. 
Last year, though, at the start of the pandemic, the Chancellor said in Parliament that whatever extra resources our NHS needs to cope with coronavirus, it will get, so that money didn't get in the way of the pandemic response. And therefore, we had top up funding through CCGs to cover the costs um, incurred by all local organisations. There was extra money to deal with the impact of COVID, such as covering staff absence, buying PPE, things like that. We were told how much to pay local hospitals. We didn't have to agree contracts. And there was a significant amount of extra money to support rapid discharge of patients from hospital. This approach is now changing, though, as the NHS looks to return to more of a business as usual approach to finances, and there's therefore the expectation that we'll be asked to deliver significant efficiency savings starting in the second half of this year and ramping up into next year. Moving to the next slide just outlines our financial achievements last year. So it shows that we delivered our statutory financial duties, the first one of which is to spend no more than the money that we're given by NHS England, that was that 1.9 billion, and we delivered a very small surplus. Our second statutory duty is to contain the costs of running the CCG within a specific sum set by NHS England nationally. And we achieved this having reduced our cost of running the organisation following the merger of the five previous CCGs. We also delivered the key planning requirements that are set by NHS England and importantly within that we delivered the mental health investment standard. This used to be known as parity of esteem and it requires us to give a disproportionate funding uplift to mental health services compared to other sectors. So in North and Waveney, our expected uplift for mental health services was 6%. We actually increased our spending by 9%. That's over £13 million extra money going to mental health last year. And that ties in with some of the things that Arden was talking about earlier. So then moving to my final slide, it just shows you where we spent our £1.9 billion last year. So the biggest section far and away on the right there, we spent 48%, £907 million on commissioning care from acute, the acute sector, which is principally the James Paget Hospital, the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital and the Queen Elizabeth in Kings Lynn. Then moving around the wheel, you can see the other sections. The next largest area of spend in the grey there is mental health services, around 10, 10%, and then primary care and GP prescribing. So every time someone is issued a prescription from the GP, the cost comes back to us as the CCG. So that's a very brief summary of what's reflected in a 100 page document on our website, the annual report and accounts, and obviously more detail is there if you want to access it. So I'll now hand over to Melanie, I believe, who's going to talk about what's in store for the next 12 months. Thank you very much, John, and um, I'd like to now just focus on the next 12 months and indeed it will be uh, again further change for the CCG and I believe we've had a question from the public on this matter around um, the future of clinical commissioning groups. At the moment, there are a number across the whole of England and these were set up in 2012. Um, and we have had a number of legislative changes where government will change how services are organised and planned. And we're just coming up to another significant change subject to the successful passing of the legislation through government. Um, subject to that, clinical commissioning groups will um, be replaced by integrated care systems and the element of responsibilities that the CCG has will transition to a part of the integrated care system called an integrated care board and there is lots of guidance on this on government websites on NHS websites um, but certainly we have just four five or six months really to complete all of that planning and I'll just say a little bit more about the integrated care uh, systems if we could move on to the next slide please and the purpose of the integrated care systems which are set out have four key uh, four key aims and I want to really just highlight um, how different these aims are and what's being prioritized compared to the past uh, 10 years we've we've seen and importantly, I think very much building on the pandemic and what's happening in the country has been to uh, just I look at the fourth uh, priority to help the NHS support the broader social and economic development and having ha for the integrated care board taking a much more explicit and prominent role in that I think is absolutely right. But this is a uh, an area of work that's been more emergent rather than dominant in the last regime. Moving on to the next slide, please. Um, integrated care systems have two types of integration. 
um, both are both are very important, but there is not at the moment enough integration between the even within the NHS itself. We've seen that increase um, and the benefits from that much more over the last 18 months when NHS organisations came together to operate as if they were a single team. Um, and whilst we are still remaining lots of different organisations, there's now requirements on us all to act together as one, which is important. And then the other type of integration is the integrating the NHS with local government and others, such as voluntary sector particularly, and social enterprise. And that's not a formal reorganisation, but it's there's a requirement to integrate with other partners especially looking at the uh, working on the wider determinants of health such as housing, employment, education, where other parts of the public sector and voluntary sector will have a much more dominant role. On to the next slide please. The um, three goals, th these are three goals that have been set locally for Norfolk and Waveney um, for our system, helping people achieve as healthy a life as they possibly can making sure that you only have to tell your story once. So in order to do that, that means the, um, the, that by definition, the health services and health and social care services must be more joined up uh, in order for that to be uh, an outcome for people. And we know it's very important for, um, for, for members of the public to do that. And also to make Norfolk and Waverley the very best place to work in health and care. So those are our three local goals and on to the next slide please. Um, as I said earlier we have just a few months to complete our, our work. Um, this is quite a short transition um, and that uh, whilst much of the work will happen at system level it's also really important that there is a local focus as part of the integrated care system. So there will be five health and care alliances um, based on the former CCG um, boundaries. Now these again are not five organisations, they are five partnerships coming together to focus on what is most important for local people. And there'll be more around um, that and how patients and public can become more involved in that work, over, that will be more explicit over coming months. We will be working very closely with district councils and voluntary sector, especially at that alliance level. And then we have our 17 primary care networks which continue to operate at what we describe as a neighbourhood level, very localised level, so they can respond directly to the needs of their populations, which will be different across all of Norfolk and Waveney. So very important that within an integrated care system or in an, as an ICS, there are the three levels of integration. Primary care network at the uh, most localised level, then the five alliances and then the system, which is Norfolk and Waveney. That's a real change from what we've previously had. We've either had big or we've either had small, but we haven't had those three levels and different things need to be done at different levels. Different decisions need to be made. Um, so uh, on to the next slide, please. And just to finish, these are our operational priorities uh, over the next six months elective recovery, urgent emergency care, mental health, financial improvement and the vaccination programme. So that's just a snapshot of what the next 12 months looks like. Thank you, Anouk. OK, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Melanie. Um, so the, the next, um, can I just thank all the um, all the presenters for, for those presentations. We've now um, got about 15, uh, 15 minutes or so um, for the final section, which is an opportunity to answer questions from members of the public. And I know we had some questions given uh, to us beforehand and, and probably some questions that have come in during, um, during this meeting. Uh, and, and Paul, are you going to sort of talk us through some of the questions and, uh, and ask the panel members, which are the presenters, but also other senior officers and governing body members uh, who are at this meeting as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Howard. 
Um, so thank you to everybody that's been listening um, and joined uh, our annual general meeting today. We have had quite a few questions that have come in, so we will do our very best to answer as many as we can today. If we don't get to answer all the questions, what we will do is we will make sure within uh, by the end of the week, we will include all the questions that have been asked with a formal response on our website and we'll signpost to that via social media and send an email out uh, via our different networks and forums. So rest assured that um, if you have asked, asked a question today and we haven't been able to answer it, you will get a response to your question. So the, one of the first questions that we've had asked today is, are there enough face-to-face -face appointments at GP practice level taking place across Northcombe Waverney? And are they back to the level that they were before the pandemic? And can more be done to increase the number of face-to-face -face, um, appointments? Anoop, would you be happy to initially respond to that one? Um, Paul, can you, just, can you just repeat the question? I didn't quite catch. Sure. So are enough face to face appointments taking place across North and Waverney from a GP practice point of view? Are they back to the level that they were before the pandemic and can more be done? Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, this is this is um, something that's been very much in the in the media and it is of concern to patients, GP access generally and particularly um, face to face contacts. Um, what we know is that um, general practice uh, access uh, was changing even before the pandemic. We very much wanted practices to use uh, technology more. Um, so, so perhaps we're already using online services and telephone consultations more. And that was very much accelerated out of necessity during the pandemic. Um, and, there were, and there have been concerns about uh, whether it's, you know, whether patients were, were not being seen enough face to face. The current situation is that the, um, the number of patient contacts are now more than they were prior to the uh, pandemic. Um, the face-to-face -face number of contacts aren't as much as they were before the pandemic, but the other ways of contacting practices and having contacts with GPs uh, and, their, uh, and their staff uh, and people that work with them uh, are, are much more than they were previously. So particularly online uh, access uh, and, um, and telephone access, um, which, a lot of patients do appreciate. So it's one of the things that we found in Northern Wavy, for example, uh, is that younger people and working people who previously didn't access primary care as much are much more willing and able to access those services. So there have been advantages. It is something that GPs are, are aware of and all general practices in Northern Wavy have been providing face-to-face -face contacts throughout the pandemic. Uh, and if patients need to be seen face-to-face, that then that, that is something that we are promoting and which is accessible across the area. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anoop. Would any other panel members wish to add to that response? No. Um, we've got um, another question today, which is what progress is being made with the Way 4B funding for the replacement town centre GP surgery in Kings Lynn? Um, or South Lynn, when St James moves out to South Wotton. Um, Howard Martin, our Director of Population Health Management and Inequalities, could you answer that one, please? Uh, yep, thank you, uh, Paul, and uh, thank you to the Council for the question. Um, so uh, as a reminder, the, uh, the Wave 4B was um, a £25 million allocation of capital funding. Uh, provided to Norfolk and Waveney as a whole in order to develop and modernise primary care estate. Um, the funding has been distributed e equitably uh, across the five old CCG footprints, um, including West Norfolk. Um, and uh, following an, an assessment of both future demand and capacity, uh, which identified Kings Lynn as having the greatest future need, um, we've been looking to develop a case for use of the West Norfolk element uh, to develop a modern primary care facility in Kings Lynn. I think overall, um, and sorry, and just to say that that process is supported by an engagement group um, of which uh, Councillor Kemp is, is an active member and that group meets roughly once a month. Um, I think overall progress is good. Um, we're currently in the middle of a formal uh, business case process that all such programmes need to go through, including the appraisal of potential options um, and we're not anticipating significant problems in attracting a primary care provider to work from this site. 
Um, and I think it's just important to say that at this point we need to um, actively go through that process properly so that we don't put the delivery um, of the project at risk. But I think overall um, the project is is going well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Howard. We've now got a question on relating to inpatient safety for individuals that have diabetes when they're admitted into hospital for planned or an emergency admission. And the question is um, linked to national and regional research about the impact of hospital admission on the care of people that have diabetes. Um, so Dr Hamblin, would you be able to answer, respond to that question? Yes, um, thank you. Um, and thank you for the question. It's a, clearly a very important topic. As many of you will know, a significant proportion of people in hospital at any one time are people living with diabetes and they often have very complex needs and it's really important that they have personalised care. Um, as a consequence of which, um, inpatient care is very much a focus of national attention and one of the key national priorities. Um, across the east of England, we're very lucky in that we have a very active um, network for diabetes care and we also have a forum um, for inpatient diabetes care, which is led by Professor Mike Sampson. And that meets regularly and discusses a lot of the concerns and issues faced by people living with diabetes who are in hospital. Um, one of the recommendations from that forum, which followed our regional audit, um, was that there should be an increase in funding to support the expansion of diabetes uh, nursing, inpatient nursing service. And I'm delighted to say that that funding has now been fed through to um, all hospitals across the east of England, but including our three um, hospitals here in Norfolk and Waveney. The medicines management teams form a, an integral part of diabetes inpatient care um, and, and um, support um, patients with medication during their hospital admission um, and um, obviously um, do work to latest guidance and recommendations. These are also things that are reviewed regularly at regional network and within our local Norfolk and Waveney Diabetes Programme Board. And during the course of this year, we have um, set up a designated group that looks at diabetes inpatient nursing service. One of the um, key components of the additional funding is obviously to ensure enhanced support for people with diabetes during the hospital admission, but also the upskilling of um, other healthcare professionals working in hospitals so that they are more aware of the challenges faced by people living with diabetes. So that's very much a work in progress and something that is very much a, a focus of attention um, for our diabetes teams locally. Thanks very much, Dr. Hamblin. We've also now got a question in relation to what more can be done to convince the remaining 12% uh, of the over 18s to get both doses of the COVID vaccine. And could I invite um, Howard Martin, our SRO for the COVID vaccination programme, and Tracy Williams, our clinical lead for inequalities, to answer that question, please? Yes, um, thank you, Paul. Shall, Tracy, would you like to go first? Um, so Tracy's our um, clinical lead for inequality. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we are encouraging and supporting people at every opportunity that we can. You're probably aware of many of the, the media campaigns that we, we've had, but what we've absolutely found is that what works and how we can support people is a more personalised approach. So you may have heard um, in the local press and certainly on Radio Norfolk and local radio about our worry bus whereby we can actively you know engage and support communities that for whatever reason may have concerns about the vaccine um, may just find access really difficult and we have a roving team that um, works on our worry bus and can administer the vaccines in different parts of Norfolk and Waveney in community settings which has been really successful we, 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 you know, we're here, all of our clinicians across um, Norfolk and Waveney, all of our providers of the vaccination programme are here to support and answer questions and make a, a real personalised approach for people. De um, Howard might, might want to talk a bit more on some of the, the data and the oversight that we have as well, so I'll hand, hand over to Howard. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, yes, we, we, we've got a, a vaccine inequalities oversight group that oversees this really important work, and I think it's really important to say that we recognise that this is this is an issue. 
Um, and Norfolk and Waverley, of course, is not unique in this. Uh, there is certainly a, a gap in vaccine uptake between our most and least deprived populations um, in, in Norfolk and Waverley. And again, that's it's not unique to Norfolk and Waverley, it's a, it's a national issue. Um, and in addition to the work that uh, Tracy is describing, we've also had a really, really um, big focus on both the comms, um, so the communications about safety and um, efficacy of the of the vaccine, and also to ensure that people have um, as much access to it as they possibly can. So we have a wide range of walk-in sites across the whole uh, of the ICS, and this has really been supported also by a, a website that um, has been developed with um, our partners in Norfolk County Council uh, to uh, point people to the most appropriate site that they can get to, and that's now in multiple languages as well. So um, thank you. Thanks very much, Howard. We are approaching the end of our AGM today, but we've just got time for one last question. And one of the questions that's come in today is what is the CCG actively doing to attract GPs and other clinicians to our area, considering that we have a shortage? Melanie, could I ask, ask you to start off th th that question, please, and then anybody else can chip in? Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, we are working very hard on this and, and there are many national initiatives as well as regional initiatives to try and encourage GPs into, into or to encourage young doctors to become a GP and also when they are a GP to become in a partner as well. That's very important. So um, partnership is still uh, you know, a strong part of our model. And there are things that we can do locally as well. One of the things I want to just um, say as well is that both with our secondary care colleagues, so our, the, the doctors that work in hospitals and with the public, it is really important that we create the conditions to attract people to want to come into this profession. It's a very, very hard, very demanding job. GPs or doctors have a lot of choices about which profession they or which area of medicine they choose to specialise in and I want to make it as attractive as possible for GPs or for doctors to want to be a GP in Norfolk and Waveney. One of the ways PPGs, patient public, public engagement groups can help and members of the public is by supporting their GP, valuing their GP and really I think there is a concern at the moment that the um, negative publicity that GPs are receiving um, could actually have a detrimental effect on um, GP, on doctors wanting to become uh, GPs. And, and that would be a real uh, tragedy. GPs and primary care is the backbone of the NHS. So I would really urge everybody's support Find out more about what's actually happening, what is going on in your practice um, and how you can help your GP. And I would say that will be, be as effective as any local national initiative that we do to create the conditions that this really is one of the best jobs in medicine that um, doctors can choose. So thank you, Paul. Thanks so much, Melanie. Um, and I'll just hand back over to yourself and you just to uh, wrap today's AGM uh, together. OK, thanks. Uh, th thank you, Paul. Um, uh, so uh, we're coming to well, we're, we're at the end of the, the meeting. So th thank you, um, everybody, for uh, for conducting the meeting. In particular, I want to just thank uh, I mean, none of these things happen without a lot of organisation. So particularly, I want to start by thanking Jody. Uh, Tristan and Paul in particular for organising and conducting the, uh, the, 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 um, the the technical side of, uh, of today's AGM. I want to thank the, uh, the presenters, the panel members for their contributions uh, and to everybody who, who have asked questions and contributed um, on the AGM. Um, finally, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, uh, as chair on behalf of the organisation particularly all the staff within uh, the Clinical Commissioning Group. Uh, I've seen at first hand 
the commitment and dedication that they've shown. Uh, and a lot of them have gone out of their job descriptions, out of their comfort zones to do what was necessary in a very difficult time, looking after our population and supporting our hospitals and our general practices. So I just want to say a personal thank you, but also on behalf of the organisation to all the staff uh, within the CCG who've, who've worked magnificently in the last year. Um, so on, on that note, uh, I'll close the meeting and thank everybody for, for attending today.